Okay, we're live. Um, I'll wait a couple of minutes just to let people join. If you do join, please say hi in the comments. I'll post a comment there as well to let people know. Um, oh, we've got someone joining in already, so we, a good start. I know we had some great ambassadors waiting to, to get in. I think this is going to be a popular one. Oh, there we go. We've got Jay here already. Hi, Jay. Hi, Claire. Getting a few people in. Uh, sorry, everyone, that we were a bit late. We had some technical issues and we're just sorting things out. Oh, thanks, Will. Getting a few people joining. Got Rob as well. We're getting the whole team. <laughs> We had a really successful live earlier on, actually, that I haven't told you about yet. Um, we, we launched our Giving Tuesday with all of the team members. We had about eight of us going backwards and forwards on the live and sharing why we're passionate about 7030. So it's definitely worth a look at some point if you do find a minute. That was a good start. You've got all my favorite people on board already. So. <laughs> definitely. Oh, we've got Angela as well. There we Hi. go. Hi, Great guys. to see Hi, so many people. Wonderful to. Well, I don't actually see you, but uh, I know no. you're there. <laughs> got Debbie too. There we go. Got everyone in place. I might get started soon. I'll say hi to anyone if they keep joining. So please do keep commenting and as well, and, and we'll go ahead. So thank you for joining me. I know how busy you are. And fitting in this life has been, um, I think, an interesting thing of matching up calendars, but I'm glad we finally managed to do it. Um, and I think it might be one of our most important ones so far in terms of content, um, as we've done quite a lot around the 7030 campaign, but not a lot in terms of lives around WAVE itself and violence prevention at the core of everything that we do. Um, so I wanted a little bit of an introduction from yourself to say hi. I think we use these lives a lot to, to give a bit of personality to the team and to let people get to know us. Um, but if you could also say a word or two about why violence prevention is at the core of what we do, that would be great. Yeah, probably just helps if I say why I set up WAVE in the first place. Um, way back in the early 1990s, I was chief executive of a international strategy consultancy. And we give 1% of our revenue every year to a different charity. And it was, uh, each year it was a different charity. You know, one year it might have been, it was Oxfam, another year Save the Children. And as it happened on uh, one year, it was the NSPCC. And because it was the NSPCC, I became interested in learning a bit more about child abuse, which until then, frankly, had not been a topic of particular interest to me. My, my background was more interest in supporting the economic development of poor countries. Mm -hmm. um, but I started to read things about child abuse. And around about that time, there were two horrendous cases of child abuse in London in which children were murdered by their parents, Dif different children, different families. And whereas previously I might just have read the headlines, on this occasion I read all the backup mm -hmm. information, uh, particularly in the Evening Standard, which really went into a great deal of detail about the lives of these children before they were murdered. And by the time I'd finished reading their stories, I'd come to the conclusion that being murdered was the best thing that ever happened to these children. That they were living such lives of unspeakable torture that murder was a merciful release from what they were being put through. And I was shocked to the core. I'd always imagined up until that point that child abuse was basically something like a parent hitting a child too hard, maybe even breaking a bone, um, you know, doing something over the top in a moment of anger and hurting a child. But the idea that children could actually be subject to systematic torture month after month after month of their little lives was beyond my comprehension. And something snapped inside me. And a decision got made, and I've never felt as if I made the decision. It's always felt like the decision made me. And the decision was, I can't live in a world like this, where this kind of thing happens to children, and I do nothing about it. 
And ever since that day that that decision got made, my life has been driven by the knowledge that I have a requirement to protect children from that kind of abuse and harm mm -hmm. and violence. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a clue what to do. I, I had the slightest idea why anybody would harm a child, and I certainly didn't know what to do if they did. But I kept reading about it and thinking about it. And then about a year or so later, while I still was learning a lot about the subject, but not having a clue what to do, but then, I don't know whether it was the chair or the president of the NSPCC made a speech. This was in 1995. And in that speech, he said that levels of child abuse in Britain had not gone down one iota in the 50 years between the end of the Second World War, 1945, and 1995. And I was kind of shocked because in supporting the NSPCC, who, by the way, do great work in helping children after they've been abused, um, I'd always imagined that they were preventing it before they were abused. Mm -hmm. And I used to be an international troubleshooter with a large multinational corporation called Unilever. They used to send me all around the world to um, countries in every continent uh, where I'd be asked to solve problems. Mm -hmm. And I was typically given two weeks to solve a problem before I left Malaysia or Bangladesh or Japan or Costa Rica or uh, Morocco or Nigeria, wherever yeah. I was going. So I, I had to solve the problem in two weeks or I had to leave a plan to solve the problem that would be solved subsequently. So I knew if I'd walked in the, the Unilever house and told people that I'd been working on something for 50 years and I hadn't made any difference, my Unilever career wouldn't have lasted another 30 seconds after that. <laughs> yeah. So I thought, well, what are they doing wrong? What, what is it that they're doing or not doing that they're not making a difference? And because I was a strategy consultant, I then thought, well, what, what if I gave myself a project in child abuse as a strategy <laughs> project? What would I do? And the first thing you do in a strategy project is you survey the current terrain of whatever area you're looking at, you find out what, what's happening currently. Mm -hmm. Because I've been trained by Unilever to think globally, I looked all over the world at how people were tackling child abuse. And what I found was that the same thing was happening everywhere. Everyone was addressing the symptoms, i.e. reacting after the child abuse take place. Nobody, anywhere, no country, no government, no charity, was actually preventing it before it happened. Mm -hmm. So as a business strategist, that just didn't make sense to me. So I searched all over the world for a charity that was preventing child abuse before it happened, intending then to switch support to them. And I didn't find one. And at this point, my friends were getting utterly bored with me talking about this subject. And they said, George, if you can't find such a charity, why don't you start one? Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel like a good idea because I thought that would be a huge amount of admin and bureaucracy and so on. And I just wanted to be influenced, in, influencing in, in the policy area. But in the end, that's what I did. I created a charity. Mm -hmm. It's called WAVE. WAVE stands for Worldwide Alternatives to Violence. And um, particularly, we were created to protect children from violence. But I rapidly learned because part of my journey was I then spent two years training to become a clinical criminologist. Mm -hmm. And I learned that violence in society and child abuse are inextricably wrapped up together. Yeah. You know, a large proportion of um, violent people have been abused as children. And something like one in three children who are abused become violent. Hmm. Uh, so I, I broadened our goal, not just to stopping child abuse, but to stopping all forms of interpersonal violence. Sorry, that was a very long answer to a very short question. <laughs> no, I, th I think it was the background we need. Uh, we, it, it's good to get to know Wave a little bit better there. I think um, there's a lot of people, especially in the chat, we've been joined by quite a few more people um, who don't know Wave as well as a background, because I think on a social media level, on a public level, we're often pushing for the 7030 campaign that was launched by Wave. Um, and I guess I kind of wanted to ask, linking into that do you think obviously in a 
indirect way, 7030 is key to preventing violence in the same way that we're hoping to prevent child abuse, because as you said, they are intrinsically linked. But do you see a particular role for the prevention of violence within the 7030 campaign? Well, 7030 is a prevention campaign. It, you know, you can almost summarise 25 years of WAVE's history with one word, prevention. Yeah. All our grandmothers knew that prevention was better than cure. Uh, prevention is better than um, cure. Uh, a stitch in time saves nine. You know, it, it, it's, it, the world is full of sayings that indicate that if you act early enough, you stop mm -hmm. far worse consequences later. Yet in our public policy around violence and child abuse, we don't do that. Even today, uh, we pour huge amounts of money into dealing with violence by teenagers, but very mm -hmm. tiny amounts of money by comparison into making sure that babies don't develop violent personalities. Yet by age two, the children who will be the future violent offenders in later years are already at age two, 10 mm -hmm. times more aggressive than peaceful children age two. Uh, so one of the things we discovered through years of research into how to prevent violence and how to prevent child abuse is that the critical time to influence people is at the very beginning of their lives, particularly in the first three years. Uh, and prevention in that sense is at the heart of 7030. So 7030 is about reducing levels of child abuse, neglect, neglect domestic violence by 70% by the year 2030. And that will only be achieved by preventing the steps that lead mm -hmm. to each of these problems. So prevention yeah. of violence, yeah. prevention of child abuse, prevention of domestic violence, all of these are wrapped up together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so this isn't actually one of the questions I thought of before. It's one that's just come up in, based on what you were saying there. Um, what do you think we can do and I mean this in, not in terms of large systemic changes, but I mean more in terms of bringing things to the conversation, um, in terms of specific types of violence that get attention. You know, I know that, for example, violence against women has become quite relevant in the news recently, or as you said, kind of knife crime with teenagers, etc. Or, you know, there's specific types of violence become more relevant at certain moments um, to the public opinion. How do you think we can bring this knowledge of prevention to that discussion? Obviously, it would be wonderful if we could get the press mm. on board the message of prevention, because a lot of the reactions that politicians make to violence is because of newspaper headlines. You know, newspaper headlines say um, knife crime in London is up 25% on last year and uh, politicians get asked questions about that and they very rapidly start to want to come up with solutions and one of the solutions is let's put money into stopping knife crime. Yeah. Uh, they don't think let's stop knife crime by creating babies who wouldn't be violent. Mm -hmm. They still allow the violent babies to get created. They only think of doing something because they want quick results, mm -hmm. which is about, you know, how can we go onto the streets and engage with these teenagers who are engaging in knife crime and persuade them to stop doing it. By the way, that's a very good thing to do, and I'm all in favor of it. But it's a bit like you've got a, a, a you know, tap that's running and pouring water in an overflowing sink that's running down your stairs and flooding your house. Mm -hmm. and what you're doing all the time is you're organizing more and more money to be spent on bailing the water up as it flows down the stairs and throwing it out into the street. But nobody's actually going up and turning off the taps. Yeah. And yeah. that's what we've been, I've been in this field for 25 years. For 25 years, we have failed to turn off the taps. Mm -hmm. If we turned off these taps 25 years ago, we would have a very, very different world today and you know my hope is that through 7030 we will finally get those taps turned off so somehow we've got to get that message firstly through to the press uh, the politicians get it by the way they, they understand this we already have over 500 mps out of 650 mm -hmm. supporting the 7030 campaign but what doesn't then happen is it's not being followed through in the way money is allocated so we've somehow got to get the people who control the money 
in the treasury um, and the uh, key government ministers who determine uh, treasury policy, which of course includes the prime minister, mm -hmm. really to get this as something that has to be done. And one of the ways we make it something that has to be done is by it being very widely spoken about and talked about. And that's where the 7030 ambassadors come in. And we've already had some great successes uh, recently in Scotland, for example, uh, with motions in Edinburgh City and Western Bartonshire, uh, where uh, local councillors have put forward the 7030 message and got a, a whole local area like Dumbarton or Edinburgh to make a commitment to support the 7030 campaign. We've got to keep that great work which our ambassadors are doing. We have some wonderful ambassadors. They're doing super work. But we need more, more ambassadors, and we need bigger momentum in the campaign that we've got. 100%. And I'm just going to plug a little bit here whilst we're there. Uh, we're currently fundraising for the 7030 campaign for Giving Tuesday. So please do head on over to wavetrust.org. And there's a big red donate button at the top right. So um, any little bit helps because that, that is how we're going to get there. That's how we're going to get it in front of people. That's how we're going to get the attention and, and move forward. Um, I'm seeing lots of great questions in the comments, but I'm not going to flag them up just now. I'll keep them for the Q&A section later. Um, so please do keep them coming. I have seen them. Um, I will just get us through a little bit first. Um, so yeah, I guess the main thing I wanted to ask you as we've got your expertise is if you could break down the key steps, you know, say, I know that some of the work I've been doing has been looking at what can we do to prevent violence. And we've talked about, you know, supporting people in early life. But what does that actually mean? You know, if people needed a bit more knowledge background, what were the key takeaways that they need to have? Well, there are various steps on the pathway to violent personalities. Um, we know that right at the beginning of life, that when a parent has a really great relationship with their child, uh, it interacts in a very positive and supportive and loving way with the child, uh, that that tends to produce both a more healthy child, uh, a more socially competent child, and a child who's much less likely to have bad relationships or violent relationships with other people. Um, and we can trace, as I said, by age two, you can tell children who've have gone down the wrong pathway in this sense. By age 15 to 18 months, we can measure something called mm -hmm. attachment, which shows what the basic template is of a child's <clears throat> relationships for the rest of their life. It doesn't mean that template at 15 or 18 months never changes. It can change. Mm -hmm. But statistically, whatever that template is at that age is likely to be pretty dominant in how that person lives their life in terms of relationships. 60% of the UK population develop what's called secure attachment. Secure attachment means that they basically have developed a very good, strong bond with their parents or caregivers, that they feel confident that they're going to be looked after and cared for in life. And they see relationships as something positive uh, and, and they are developing the skills to engage with other people in relationship in a positive way. Children show empathy by 12 months of age. Mm. And securely attached children will be children who show empathy. If they see another child suffering, they will want to help that child. Unfortunately, about 40% of children develop the other type of attachment, insecure attachment. And that's strongly associated uh, that is to say, there is a higher statistical probability with future life outcomes, such as going into being taken into care, uh, having poor mental health, uh, behaving disruptively in school, uh, failing in education, um, developing all kinds of other issues in life of a negative nature, but especially in relationships. So most domestic violence perpetrators, for example, uh, will have insecure attachment. Uh, and then there's within that a type called disorganized attachment, which is even more extreme negative uh, results than the insecure attachment. And that affects about 15% uh, of the population. We know how to change that right at the beginning of life. 
uh, as you know only too well, Isabel, because you have uh, helped me develop our knowledge of the programme. There is a Spanish programme that we have now introduced to the UK, which is now running in London, which ran for 20 years in Spain and 15 years in Ireland, which has cut insecure attachment in half and cut disorganised attachment in half. Mm -hmm. If we replicated that in the UK, we would be transforming the lives directly of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of children every year for the rest of their lives. But we'd yeah. also transform yeah. the lives of their communities because mm -hmm. there'd be far less violence in the future. Now, I could name many other programs as well, but that's not the only good program. It's called PCPS, Parent Child Psychological Support. Um, but there are many other great programs that also are beneficial in the early years and some great ones in the later years, because I've worked with people right up till in their 50s, stopping them from being violent successfully. It can be done at any time in a person's life. But the earlier you do it, the greater the impact. And also, it's cheaper and easier when you do it early. But we have to persuade government to put sufficient money into prevention in the early years. That's the whole purpose of the 7030 campaign. If we succeed, 7030 will succeed. If we don't succeed, 7030 will fail. Absolutely. And oh, I can hear a bit of echo just a second. Sorry, I've muted you just a second for the echo. I'll mute you when I ask the next question. Um, in terms of PCPS, it's a wonderful, wonderful program. I saw it firsthand in Spain and I was blown away by the results they were getting. If you do want more information, I believe we have the briefing on it on our website as well under our resources. So do have a look there. And we also have things like our reports on violence prevention uh, and infographics around ACEs and trauma as well. So do check that out if you want a bit more information. Um, as a follow up question, this one is a bit more based around my work. I'm going to take advantage of having um, a bit of your time here. Um, obviously, as much as possible, we want to intervene early on. But as you said, you can help at any stage in someone's life. I'm now getting involved with police forces and managing police and crime situ um, area of WAVE's work. What do you think police forces can do in terms of preventing violence? Well, two immediate answers jumped to my mind. Um, one is that, uh, as you know only too well, Isabel, we are very much promoting the approach of trauma-informed policing. Mm -hmm. uh, trauma-informed approaches, which are not just for policing, they're also for schools, health services, probation, prisons, um, housing associations, uh, you know, you, you name it, there, there's almost hardly any area of public services where trauma-informed approaches aren't now being found to produce better outcomes um, at lower cost than the, the previous uh, alternatives. And certainly in police forces, since WAVE was asked by the National Police Chiefs Council to run the first ever UK-wide trauma-informed policing workshop, way back in uh, gosh, was it 2017, so long ago. Um, now, we've been promoting the development of trauma-informed policing, and there's now quite a number of police forces uh, around the UK and Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland, England, which are becoming or have become trauma-informed police forces. That changes something fundamental in the relationship between police and offenders, and it helps to reduce uh, offending in doing so. So that's one direct thing that I'd encourage any police force which has not already made the commitment to trauma-informed policing to explore it, find out about it, uh, talk to either other police forces like um, Lancashire, for example, or Gloucestershire uh, or Ayrshire, which have already made that commitment, or talk to WAVE and find out more about it from WAVE. But secondly, police can be hugely influential on a multi-agency basis. Our first successes in WAVE came in Scotland through partnership with the Scottish Violence Reduction Unit and Strathclyde Police as it was at that time. But because the police were saying exactly the same things that WAVE was saying about the importance of prevention and the importance of prevention in the early years, 
politician listened. Politicians listen to them in a different way. You know, if, if a psychologist stands up and says, we need to invest more money in early years prevention, it can be dismissed as, well, there's another academic with his particular um, topic that he, he cares about. But when a hardened uh, merger specialist in a police force like John Carnahan in Strathclyde Police stands up, having been the, the equivalent of Taggart, for those of you who've ever watched Taggart on TV, the equivalent of Taggart for many years in the police force in Glasgow, stands up and says, um, I, what I want is investment in prevention in the early years, that people listen. And John, in my mind, I will never forget, there was one Scottish election taking place where all the political parties in Scotland were trying to outdo each other in saying if they were elected, they would put more policemen on the street. And John Carnahan made the front page of the Glasgow Herald in Scotland, uh, banner headlines saying that as the top police murder specialist in Scotland, that wasn't his description, but anyway, that's what he was, um, he would rather see 1,000 extra health visitors than 1,000 extra policemen, because he recognized that investment in the early years was vital. And I'm not saying it's connected because it's many years later now, but Scotland has been massively increasing its health visitor workforce in recent years, whereas over the last five or six years, the health visitor force in England has been uh, very, very significantly uh, being reduced. So it, police can make a big difference when they start getting involved, not just in policing, but working with other agencies. So in Leicestershire, for example, where WAVE is currently working, on a multi-agency basis. We have police, probation, NHS, uh, schools, um, social services, and many other organizations all working together on a multi-agency basis to promote prevention and trauma-informed practice in Leicester City, Leicestershire, and Rutland. And police are playing the driving role in that. So, don't think police can only influence what happens within a police force. They can have a huge impact for good in society beyond that. Absolutely, thank you. Oh, and you reminded me there of what you said earlier about turning off the taps. I know in terms of health visitors that there was recently a campaign by um, the first 1001 days around increasing health visitors. And I think they, they use the slogan turning off the taps are very much in line with everything where they're saying there. If that is one of the major things that would make a huge difference in, in this increase of, of all of these issues, not just crime and violence, but mental health issues, physical health issues, etc. cetera. Um, I also just wanted to flag Claire's point about absolutely police are first the off the first people on the scene uh, for whatever reason um, for many 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 different situations I know I've spoken to a couple of police officers myself and they were talking about you know domestic violence calls car crashes um, issues at school so many different situations so they can be essential um, I think I do have a couple more questions but I think I might open it up to a Q&A uh, for a little bit first and then move back maybe 10 minutes Q&A if you're happy with that. I'm very happy with that, yes. Brilliant. Um, I will have a look through some of the questions we've got. Um, one that is kind of me reinterpreting a few comments from lots of different people is as people who have experienced violence or have experienced trauma, um, what can they do to protect themselves from both the effects of violence and further violence? Um, in looking at this? Um, I, I can interpret protect in various ways because obviously mm. in, in one sense if you get systemic change in the way uh, we implement trauma-informed services then that's very much one form of protection. Uh, another thing is just getting to understand, um, you know, if we're talking about danger of them actually being on the receiving end of violence, then one of the key things is to understand what drives violence. Mm -hmm. So just to pick up that point, for example, that's another reason why training people to be trauma-informed is so valuable. Um, one of the people who very much influenced me among 
several brilliant people when I was training for my work in uh, criminology was an American uh, uh, criminologist and psychiatrist called James Gilligan, uh, who's written a, a brilliant book on violence. And James Gilligan was the head of the police are coming to join us. Um, the James Gilligan was head of the psychiatric um, unit of the prisons of Massachusetts for about 10 years. And James made a very careful study of violence, and, and I do recommend his, his books on violence to anyone who's interested. He taught me something very basic. He said, I've observed in prison, every act of violence is a result of disrespect. When people feel disrespected, that's when people with a propensity to be violent will react in a violent manner. And I've always used that whenever I work with highly violent people, I'm always very careful that I, I, I feel it anyway, because that's where I come from as a Quaker, but um, I always show them respect and I always interact with respect. And when you treat people with respect, genuine respect, and when you interact with them with respect, you're very unlikely to trigger violence. But a story I do sometimes tell in our trauma training, you may have heard it, uh, which is a very sad story, is a, a man in Surrey about 18 months ago, I think it was, who got on a train to Clapham Junction with his 13-year-old son. And on his journey to Clapham Junction, he had a bit of a, an argument with somebody else on the train. Um, I think it was about, you know, one was pushing past the other to get to somewhere else on the train. Um, a silly little thing that can happen to anybody at any time. But the person he was interacting with drew out a knife and killed him right in front of his son. And I often think if that poor man had only been through our trauma training, he would have known that what you do not do with a, a stranger who's behaving in a way that you feel looks in any way aggressive, um, what you don't do is, as he tried to do, to tell that person how wrong they were to be behaving the way they were, you don't treat them with disrespect. It is an absolute, you know, putting the, the match to the blue light paper of a hugely explosive firework. And we don't know when these dangerous fireworks are going on around us. Uh, another story, sorry to tell you so many stories, but again, it's really stuck in my mind. Uh, it happened in South Wales in a supermarket. Two women were in a supermarket in South Wales and they were both heading for the checkout and they both arrived at the checkout more or less at the same time. And the slightly older lady of the two had managed to actually get her foot in front and the younger lady behind said to her, I was here first. And the older lady didn't give way to the younger person because she was quite convinced she came first. And the younger lady pulled a knife out of her shopping bag, stabbed the older woman and killed her. Over the question of who arrived first in the queue. Some people are like unexploded bombs and they're going around our streets, our shops, um, anywhere, our transport system. And if we don't treat people carefully, you never know when you just might trigger the wrong reaction. So I don't know if I quite answered the question that you asked, but I'm trying to give some sense of how you keep yourself safe. So I think you've answered part of it. I think you've answered part of it and I might come back to the other side. I just seen a really interesting comment from Charlotte here um, about not being able to dif uh, some of her clients not being able to differentiate between tone of voice um, and what they're saying. And I know that we often say on our trauma training that it's not just what you say or the content of what you say, it's how you say it and how you're interacting. Um, and I thought this might be an opportunity for you to talk a little bit more about attunement around this, as I know that's also key. I know we've spoken about empathy and attachment, but I thought it might be worth bringing up this, this um, terminology as well. Yeah, um, in waves, um, research, we have concluded that teaching parents how to attune successfully with their babies, which is what the PCPS program does, among other things, is 
possibly the most important thing we can do to produce um, more successful parenting and more successful babies and a less violent society. Um, attuning is about reading the cues of another person's behavior, whether it's a mother as a baby or an adult interacting with another adult and responding in a way that is like, harmonious and experienced as positive by the person you're interacting with. We kind of all know what it's like to be in a conversation with a friend where you're just completely in tune with each other. You know, you just you just understand each other. You know what the other person's feeling. You can almost guess what they're going to say before they say it. And you're just having this two way interaction. It's all about, you know, just this harmoniousness, this being in tune. That's attunement. But we also probably all have had the experience of people. If you're very unlucky, it's your boss at work uh, where you have an interaction with. And you just kind of you're going like this with each other, you know, like that person doesn't get who you are or what you're trying to communicate. You don't really get what they're trying to communicate. And you're having this conversation with each other, which is never quite, you know, it's like music being played completely out of tune or a choir where people are singing and some of them are singing out of tune and so on. It just it's horrible uh, when that happens, but it can easily happen in relationships. And Charlotte's point. Thank you, Charlotte. Lovely to see you. Wonderful person that you are. Um, it is slightly worrying because, of course, we won't normally assume that someone doesn't understand that our tone of voice is what it is. It, it's taken for granted. If you're speaking to someone in a way that is meant by tone of voice to convey something, it's not certainly wouldn't be in the forefront of my mind to think somebody might not even understand the difference in my tone of voice, but all the more reason why you need to find other ways, because attunement isn't just about one thing. It's not just about voice. It's not about words. It's about the whole collection of movements, your, your eye gaze, um, the, the way you tilt your head, the way you express yourself, how you just come across the other person as between, you know, I'm somebody who cares about you, is listening to you, is interested in you and care about what you're saying to me versus you know, I've got a point of view and I'm going to get this across to you and you better be listening to me because I know better than you do, uh, which you know, quite a lot of people communicate that way. Um, it's not a very successful way of either winning people over to your opinion or winning friends and influencing people. So the skills of attunement are part of what we teach in our trauma training, but more important than that is to teach it to new, new parents about how to interact with their babies. To some parents who had great attunement when they were babies from their own parent, it may come naturally. For parents who did not have that in their own childhood, it does not come naturally. And they do need the support of having that help given to them at a very critical time. Yeah, and I have to say on that last point, when I've spoken to people in my own life, a reaction I often get or or that you see in media or ways things are portrayed is that once you're a parent, you suddenly know what to do and they're just instincts that kick in. And I think what we actually see with the science is that you tend to replicate what you were taught and how you were taught um, in some way. Or if you're not replicating it exactly, perhaps you're trying to go in the opposite direction because you realise it harms you without actually having the tools ready unless you're supported from you know your wider community in some way. Um, I think, oh, sorry, you're still on mute. There you go. Even in my four years study of psychology, I didn't learn that parenting wasn't something that came naturally. It was only when I was doing my two years of criminology that I saw research studies that clearly demonstrated that people who were parented well in childhood tend to become very good parents, and people who were parented badly in childhood have a much greater struggle to become good parents. Some of them do and succeed very well, but it is much harder for them. And these are people we should be giving every support to that we can as a society, which of course is, is why uh, WAVE supports Andrea Ledson's campaign and early years review to see more priority given to the early years. Uh, and funnily enough, not just on that side of the political fence, but I was talking this afternoon to John Ashworth the Shadow Health Secretary, and he's just as equally committed as Andrea Ledson uh, to, to the same 
outcomes, but we still don't get our Rishi Sunaks of this country, the Chancellors of the Exchequer, to put anywhere near enough money into prevention in the early years. It's what we're going to push for. It's what we're doing. I think we have enough passionate people who've joined us on the live today that it's actually going to happen. Um, I have seen incredible things be achieved by this group of people. And I think among them are parents with that very same experience who didn't have a good enough role model and are now putting in the effort to break that cycle and, and are looking for the support to do so. So definitely, I think it, it's worth mentioning that. Going back to what we were saying about um, people with lived experience um, protecting themselves from violence, we'll rephrase it in this way whilst telling our stories. And we'll feel free to collect me in the comments or anyone else. Um, but I wonder if this means what are the repercussions of coming forward with stories of violence and histories of violence? Um, and how can we look after people who do? As I think uh, we've been talking a lot about Hearts of Ace uh, on some of these live streams. And I think it would be brilliant to kind of look at Wave's approach to this. Forgive me, William. I'm, I'm not entirely sure I get your question because I'm not quite clear what you are concerned to be protected from. Um, telling your stories is wonderful. I recently saw, and um, Anthula, um, my colleague, showed me uh, a little video you'd made. It, it was brilliant. It was just so powerful. And I was just saying to Anthula, um, I've also seen a great one by uh, Jay, for example. Um, we need to gather a whole selection of these videos and use them in our training when we're showing people why trauma-informed care is so much needed. Because those videos, those stories of yours, are probably more powerful than a year of research that I might have done in one of my university visits. So your stories are fabulous, they're wonderful, and when you tell them, you absolutely rip the heart out of me. I, I just, I could cry, uh, you so touch me, from the, the things that you're talking about, because I know what hell uh, so many of you have been through, and, and individually, I know the individual hell some of you have been through. Uh, those stories are powerful. So how can we protect you? We, we have to protect you. If you need protected, I just need to slightly better understand what you want to be protected from, whether it's the impact on yourself of telling the story, uh, or whether it's that other people might react to your story in a way that you experience as negative or harmful. Sorry if I'm being a bit dim here, William, but uh, I, I didn't quite get my message. We've got a thank you. So I think we're heading in the rough direction and, and we can always revisit this. And at, at the risk of getting more work for myself at the moment when I really shouldn't, I 100% agree that uh, collecting these stories will be invaluable from Wave's perspective. And I know that part of Giving Tuesday that we're pushing towards is really sharing some of these stories and some of the lived experience to kind of um, bring that strength to the table as well. So I think we'll have a few more clips both between these live streams. I know Claire has shared amazing stories on one of my recent interviews with her on the live. Um, I believe Jay has. I know that on our last live earlier today, uh, Rob shared as well. We were getting some really powerful stories and I think it takes extreme bravery to step forward to do it but it makes all the difference in the world um okay i might feel feel free to drop any more questions you have in the comments and i will see if we can get around to them before um but i might get back to um a couple of my questions my question and this is something that i've seen come up um in some discussions and some live streams and, and also discussions with police is the distinction between victims and perpetrators when talking about violence prevention. And I know that from a scientific perspective, we know that both victims and perpetrators have a high, you know, a higher percentage of a history of abuse of violence themselves. Um, and I wanted to know how you think we should differentiate our approaches with these and how we should frame that kind of distinction from a trauma-informed perspective? Well, as you probably know, Isabel, if you look at the ACE adverse childhood experiences research, you see that the more adverse childhood, more types of adverse childhood experiences someone has suffered, the more likely they are to be 
a domestic violence perpetrator, but also the more likely they are to be a domestic violence victim. So there's a common root cause for both being a victim and a perpetrator of domestic violence, which is uh, childhood abuse. Um, I'm not saying that's the only cause of, of uh, domestic violence, but it's certainly a major cause and probably within Western society is the major cause uh, of that. And the treatment for both is essentially the same, which is to heal the trauma. You know, I, I'm a trained therapist to heal post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, almost all of the violent men I've worked with in prison had were suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. A and the reason that uh, none of my men ever reoffended with violence, I put down to the fact that I was able to treat their PTSD. So we should be treating the PTSD or other symptoms of trauma in both victims and perpetrators of violence. And in that sense, the, the treatment is the same for either. Uh, of course, there are other elements changing the, the cognitive thinking that also come to play, because it's not just about uh, trauma therapy. Um, and there, there may be issues in perpetrators like anger management and so on, which are better handled by other methods and which may or may not be present in victims. But of course, police tell us all the time when we talk to police that very often victims and perpetrators are much the same people. That, you know, a victim and a perpetrator is who pulled the knife fastest, uh, rather than there was one characteristic of people who are perpetrators and one characteristic of people who are victims. Uh, that there are disadvantaged people living challenging lives in desperate circumstances uh, who are driven to desperate measures. Uh, and this is not to justify anything. I never justify violence. But in some circumstances, uh, somebody can end up being a victim or a perpetrator. So that's probably a bit overly simplistic. Uh, but I think that the, the key treatment for both is trauma treatment and then backed up with the more specific type of treatment for those who are more inclined to uh, act out violence, who are those who've got what we call the inner propensity or leaning towards becoming violent, which can be identified as early as two or three years of age. Absolutely. And I mean, I think, and I think for me, that has been a part, a key part of a mind shift, a mindset shift throughout working with WAVE of understanding that sometimes you have to go past your gut reactions to events that you hear and understand that actually understanding root causes and understanding the prevention is more important. Stopping the harm from happening is more important than an immediate gut reaction to something that has happened. Um, and I think being able to look at a long term perspective. Um, ties into that for me of being able to say someone who has committed violence has probably had something happen in the past and unless we help them might do something further in the future um i'm just newspaper gonna let you talk editors. whilst i can answer the comments i wish our newspaper editors and headline writers could have your wisdom as a book sorry i'm just glancing at the comments quickly I think this is quite an interesting comment here. I don't know if I fully agree with the phrasing of policies aim to dysregulate people, um, but I definitely find that many policies do dysregulate people um, in certain approaches. Do you do you have any kind of feedback on that comment, George? Well, one of the fundamental trainings of, of uh, trauma-informed practice is uh, generating calm in people. So I certainly agree with Charlotte that providing calmness and inner peace is a, a very powerful therapeutic step that is beneficial to both offenders and victims. I, I'm not sure that I, but then I've never thought about it before. It's a brand new statement to me. Charlotte's statement, coming to and attaining calm ought to be the main goal of education and health. Um, I'll, I'll pass on that one. I might need to think a bit more about whether it should be the main goal 
I agree it should be a goal, an important goal of both education and health. And it certainly contributes to many other goals. Um, I agree with Charlotte that unfortunately, many, many policies, uh, I don't know if they aim to dysregulate people, but they certainly have the impact of dysregulating people. I'm currently doing some work that's involving me very much with the UK um, prison system. And I'm quite shocked at the extent to which what we're doing it, very often inside our prisons is simply making bad situations worse. Uh, and I've worked a lot with the probation service over the years. When I first started working with the probation service, which was back in the 1990s, probation was doing a really great job supporting people to stop reoffending. Sadly, there was a complete shift in the probation service driven by national policy, which for many years turned the probation service into not an organization helping prisoners to um, adapt to life out of prison uh, after release and to stop offending, but courts to maintain public safety on courts, which meant making life as tough as possible for offenders so that they wouldn't have the chance to offend again. And actually, it was completely the opposite of trauma-informed and utterly and totally had the effect of dysregulating and making situations much, much worse. I think there are some signs that this is now being recognized and that the pendulum is now beginning to swing back the other way in probation, which is uh, very, very welcome. But for a long time, probation has been a service that has been, sadly, I have to say, uh, doing a great deal of dysregulation. And I could tell you, which we probably don't have time to do today, specific stories of some of the people we've worked with where probation was actually putting people's lives at risk, even when they were told they were putting people's lives at risk. Uh, but simply, you know, they were following their way of doing things, not in any way looking at what would actually produce the best outcome in terms of not reoffending. Absolutely. I think that makes me wonder about some of the work we've been doing with WAVE in terms of changing organizations and changing systems and changing culture. Um, and I think we've had a lot of people who are super passionate about what we talk about, but are sometimes worried about or disheartened about the idea of the system around them, the setup within their, what they're working with, um, very much doing the opposite, causing harm, et cetera, and how they on their own can kind of make that difference. Now, I know we've seen what you know whatever you might call them trauma champions ace ambassadors 70 30 ambassadors in some senses etc can achieve on their own and then when you link them up but what would you kind of say to people who do worry about that kind of you know being in an environment where they feel that it's all set up to do the opposite what can they start doing to change that the world can be a depressing place at times you know we can often watch the news and when we switch off the news, be far more depressed we were uh, when we switched the news on because of the terrible things that are happening all over the world. I think every one of us right now should be deeply, deeply, deeply concerned about climate change and what our politicians around the world are doing to destroy the planet in a way that, for all we know, may be irrecoverable. It, it may be permanent, uh, the impact that they're having. So there's you know, there's plenty of reasons for pessimism around the world. However, if you take a long time scale view of life and you look back at what our prison systems were like in the early 1800s or how we used to, you know, hang people for stealing a loaf of bread or, um, you know, all manner of ways in which people were treated, the rights of women, uh, the rights of children, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. We we on in the long term view we've made progress. We've made huge progress. The world is more compassionate and more caring on the whole. I say on the whole because there are obviously periodic outbursts of exceptions like the Second World War, but on the whole the world has become a better place century by century over time. And in that sense, the march of history is for making the world a better place. It can be disheartening sometimes when you're in an environment where you don't feel like you're making progress or you think you're 
system or your senior management team are looking in exactly the wrong direction. But I, my key motto is the one that's often attributed to Edmund Burke, which is for evil to succeed, it's enough that good men do nothing. I know today he'd get into trouble for not saying good persons do nothing, but uh, forgive me, I'm old, so I still use his original quote. Um, if, if we do nothing, evil will succeed. Hearts of Ace is one of the hopes for the future of the planet. I utterly believe in Hearts of Ace. Yeah. I know when I die, which I'm not that far off doing relative to most people in this call, um, Hearts of Ace will continue carrying that lit torch into the future of making this world a better place. And every person in the 7030 campaign is making this world a better place. Every one of our Hearts of Ace ambassadors is making the world a better place. Uh, thousands of citizens every day who get involved in volunteering and supporting things and doing things with charities are making the world a better place. And we just have to keep the faith that through all the ups and downs in our own organization or our own politicians or whatever it may be, uh, we are going to outnumber the people who are bent on destroying the planet and making the world a worse place. Uh, and the day we all give up is the day that the others will win. And I'm not prepared to accept that. Yes, I think, I think, the determination to not let things get worse and the determination to make them even better um, is what has gotten waved this far in its 25 years of the many, many things it's achieved and is what will get the 7030 campaign to its goal in just nine years, as we were discussing earlier today, which is not that long when you think in terms of the, the size of the goal. But when I think back to when I first got involved with WAVE, we were at a stage where people didn't really even know what ACEs were. I, most of the conversations I had involved me giving dictionary definitions and kind of starting off from a baseline. Now I start conversations and people have the opposite problem. They're like, yes, yes, we know that. And you have to convince them that there's more to know and there's more to do and more to change. Um, and it's kind of incredible to see what a small team and, and what passion can do in the world, really. Um, what time is it? We've got a few more minutes. Do you want to do a final key points, George, a summary? What should people really know about violence prevention if you had to send people home with a last message? Violence has two major components. Um, there is the inner propensity to be violent in a person. That's one component. And the other are the triggers that set off violence. There are multiple triggers. I could list 50 triggers of violence. Alcohol, for example, is a major trigger of violence. Um, but, uh, you know, the wrong kind of media, um, violent media, for some people, is a trigger of violence. Um, some people would argue that economic repression is a trigger for violence. As I say, one could list 50 different things that could be triggers for violence. But what I discovered in my work over the years in WAVE's research is that the triggers really only create violence in people who have the inner propensity. So millions of people watch violent television every night and don't go out and commit violence as a result. Yet we do know that people brought up in violent households who watch violent television are more likely to be violent afterwards. Millions of people drink alcohol every day, yet we don't have every pub in Britain having outbursts of severe violence as all the drinkers start you know, fighting each other every night. Most people drink alcohol and remain totally peaceful. But a few people drink alcohol and become lethally dangerous after they've drunk violence. Yet, 90 or maybe it's 95% of all the attention that's given to violence is given to the triggers. It's given to the circumstances. It's given to changing the environmental factors that trigger violent behavior. And very little attention 
is given to this issue of the inner propensity. And as I've said, the inner propensity to a significant extent is developed in children very early. I mentioned earlier that a one-year-old baby, most one-year-old babies, are already showing empathy. They will already go up and cuddle or offer a toy or a sweet to another child who's crying. But an abused child who sees another child crying, I, I, I once heard a story by, um, a real story by uh, Alan um, Thruff, it was, yes, Alan Thruff, a psychologist in America, of going into a classroom where young kids about six years of age and one of the children started crying with a sore belly. And other children went up to this girl who had a sore belly and started putting her arms around her and offering her things to try and make her feel better. And one little boy just walked up to her, looked at her, and took his fist and went right into the pit of her stomach. That little boy, when he was growing up, almost certainly, when he cried, he got hit. That was what he, that was, you know, like the synapses in our brain learn what we experience. That was his experience. People cry, you hit them and then they stop or you hit them again until they stop. And it's effective. So that propensity to be violence is where we should be putting our focus more than anywhere. And we don't. So that's my final message is let's get to grips with what creates the inner tendency, willingness, openness, leaning towards, or as we call it, sorry, it's a clumsy word, propensity, to be violent. Because if we change that, we can all watch violent television and drink alcohol to our heart's content, and we still won't have a violent society. Thank you so much. I think that's a brilliant note to end on. And yeah, thank you so much everyone else who's joined us. There have been huge quantities of discussions in the comments. So if you're watching this later, do have a read through the comments as well as there have been some great stories shared. Um, but thank you so much everyone for joining. Thank you, George, for giving your time in the evening. I know how busy you are. And can I just salute the people on the call who are doing the work we are doing uh, to promote the messages of prevention the messages of 7030, uh, the work of Hearts of Ace. Uh, we have some absolutely wonderful people who are doing amazing work in spite of the most uh, terrible histories that they've had, which they've overcome with their courage and determination. And I just want to salute every one of those people. Absolutely. And I am going to echo that with ways that you can support this amazing campaign and this amazing team for Giving Tuesday. You can give your time. Please become a 7030 ambassador. Join in the team. Um, there's so much you could do in your local community. There's so much support that we can give you back. Um, it, it's an absolutely ma amazing experience. Um, give your story if, if you have one and feel that that would help you and other people. Join in with Hearts of Ace. Donate any bit of anything you can give will, will help support the ambassador network. Um, you can also share some of your expertise and knowledge around all of these issues. We know that we're not the only people who have a background in this area. And finally, share, 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 share this live stream, share everything we're doing on Giving Tuesday, share resources, um, get the word out there and, and spread the word. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. Bye.